So this, is, so this next talk is by Ron and Longsheng. And Subrata. And Subrata, but he's not here. Yeah. But he worked on the talk as well. So yeah, Subrata um, did some work on the talk as well. So, and last year at the OSFC, Ron talked about um, that this is uh, about the RAM stage and how it's already possible to um, substitute the RAM stage with the Linux kernel because the Linux kernel has so much stuff that, that the RAM stage does. So we, we don't have really have to use the RAM stage. We can just sub substitute it and um, have all that work be in the Linux kernel. So, and now... Um, this this works with core boot, but now there's work done to make it work with the slim boot loader. And so this is what the talk's going to be about. Please have a big round of applause for Ronan and Yongshan. Yeah, a minor correction. Uh, all the heavy lifting on this was done by Subrata and Sheng. I've just been kibitzing. And uh, actually, the slides are kind of really Subrata's, but he couldn't make it and asked me to stand in for him. Um, I changed the title a little because uh, that's what you get to do when you give a talk for someone. Um, so it doesn't say core boot light anymore because I never, it's not my favorite word. But um, anyway, on we go. Uh, so what we're, we've been working on this maybe since last year when, you know, I first brought up this idea um, at the talk. And uh, so we just wanted to talk about where we are. And Shang is here to watch over me and make sure I don't get too far off track. Um, but we were going to talk about RAM payload and Linux boot. And my original interest in you know removing the RAM stage is, is around Linux boot, but he's also worked on, on, on the uh, RAM payload for non-Linux kernel applications. And the idea is you just you like to try and remove as much redundancy in the RAM stage that, that is replicated in your payload as you can. So here's the quick status on that work. Um, so the observation was that um, there is functionality duplication in a boot flow, um, and uh, that can actually impact firmware boot time. Now, for most firmware, we really don't care because you know most firmware burns minutes like you know they're going out of style. Uh, but for a curse core boot, you know every 10 milliseconds or so you add is the 10 milliseconds that you've you know made your boot time worse. So um, if you can possibly remove um, that kind of thing, you can get rid of it. And so basically what this talk about is really from the core boot perspective, you know, you don't see a RAM stage in there because uh, it's either been removed or functionality got moved into Postgar. Um, so that's the goal here. And so this is a summary of the work Subrata has done on the latest uh, IA Chrome platform. Um, and I, I was there kind of providing the Linux kernel and the uh, U-root um, image for him and then testing what he was doing. Um, so here's your classic uh, core boot boot flow, which probably everybody in here knows by now. There's your boot block, your ROM stage, the postcard where you tear down caches RAM and do some MTRR stuff, and then RAM stage. And this is a heavily FSP-centric slide, as you can see. This is not like you know your grandfather's core boot. Uh, because there's just a lot of binary blob action in here with the FSP. But um, that's kind of how it's done on newer Chromebooks today and other platforms. And here's some rough size numbers. You can kind of see at the right, the RAM stage is a quarter meg. Um, and then we run depth charge. So my interest in all this is not actually in depth charge. It's in Linux boot. But you know this is what the flow looks like on, on a Chrome platform. And the experiment he did was to yank out the RAM stage and um, even though, and, I, and, and here's where things get a little concerning for me because he did yank out the RAM stage and it what did make it work, that's great. But uh, notice what happened here for depth charge purposes. Uh, and I'm the guy who made these red, they were black. But um, there's a little bit of PCI stuff going on here. And yeah, there's ACPI table creation going here. And that was a little concerning to me, although he did get some kind of nice numbers. Um, he reduced the overall uh, image by 150K. And again, you know, in a kind of an FSP UEFI world, that's just peanuts because those things chew up megabytes like nobody's business. But still, from a core boot perspective, that's a pretty good size reduction. And um, But the thing I like is, is chopping off 240 milliseconds because, again, on a Chromebook and an IoT things, every, every 10 milliseconds you save matters. I was telling Shang a story. Um, last night about a visit I had from the Navy one year 
Uh, these are the guys who put the sonar in the subs, and they said, uh, you don't like to really uh, have a sonar that takes a long time to boot because then you could be dead. So um, real life application, I've heard you know, from DOD in several cases where boot time is incredibly critical to living. And, and so you know, 240 milliseconds is no small gain in, in boot time performance. Um, Subrata makes an interesting argument. He reduced the uh, code size 41%, and in some notional measurement, that's a 10% reduction in bugs, which is not something I ever thought of. It's kind of a neat argument. Um, and again, you can you can shrink your uh, spy flash, pro, uh, uh, flash uh, footprint by a bit. Um, this is kind of neat, but again, uh, you know, I'll say it again. The areas in red for me are a little concerning because my original thought on this is we go from postcar right to Linux and, and good things happen. I would like to mention, um, if you get a chance, look at UBMC. UBMC to me is the ultimate example of getting this right. There's about a thousand lines of assembly code that turns on DRAM, then they load Linux to RAM and jump to Linux. So if you really want to look at a pretty cool example of no RAM stage, UBMC is a great place to start. And I'll further mention, you know, this idea began for me years ago um, when I was experimenting with having Plan 9 replace the RAM stage and got some pretty reasonable results that was talked about at the 2015 uh, Core Boot uh, meeting in Denver. So where this idea originated, at least in my mind, um, in 2015, I was doing a lot of work on RISC V, and I kept looking at this RAM stage, which was basically a load the next you know, load the payload RAM stage and thought, well, you know, why do I even need that then? And so I did do some experiments and I did determine that there were cases where I did not really need the RAM stage. Um, talked to Patrick Georgi about this and he kind of had a neat idea, which is if we could, we could get more flexibility in how the RAM stage is set up simply by uh, making it an optional where appropriate. And again, I'll go back to the earlier slide. Uh, maybe it's not always appropriate to remove the RAM stage, but maybe when we want to have the option to do so. And a more interesting idea, which you're actually going to see realized in the slim boot loader, uh, componentized RAM stage. So we make the RAM stage a payload. We make that payload a lot more configurable than it is today with components you can add or remove. Um, and you know, it, during the 3M dev talk that Piotr did yesterday, which was an excellent talk about virtualization support in, in core boot, they had a little bit of a tussle there because they kind of wanted to add things to the RAM stage, but that's a headache because when you add things to RAM stage, you more or less have to upstream them to core boot, and it didn't seem really appropriate for some of those components to be upstream to core boot. So if we had the idea of a RAM payload where some pieces came from core boot proper and some pieces came from my special thing, that might be a lot more powerful than what we have today in core boot. Um, and I, I, so that, that's another thought. I know for a fact, because we've done it, that Linux boot would be a little better if we could basically ditch most of the RAM stage altogether. And the areas in red I pointed out, we have experimented with removing them. One mechanism is to actually include the ACP generation in a Linux init RAMFS, not in core boot. And that's actually a fairly practical thing to do. Trammell Hudson demonstrated it on a number of server platforms. So kind of the discussion, as you all know, got a tad heated on the uh, review site and the mailing list because I feel like maybe to some extent there was a little bit of hole in the communication. Um, PCI support, should you remove PCI support? Um, you know, should you remove the RAM stage and add PCI support into Postcard? That to me doesn't make a ton of sense, right? It, it's not really about moving the deck chairs around. It's sort of like saying, I can move the RAM stage because my payload does everything that the RAM stage is doing. And in the case of Linux, that's true. Linux can configure a PCI bus nowadays where 20 years ago it could not. Um, but if we need a bunch of things for depth charge, it might make sense just to keep the RAM stage and, and not do all this. But maybe we should make a componentize. Maybe that's the right model. If, if, you, if it sounds like I'm asking more questions about how Core Boot should do this than giving you answers, that's what I'm trying to do here, right? I'm trying to spur a little discussion and thought about where should we be heading with the RAM stage? Now, Patrick Georgi put up a RAM payload um, CL for discussion, you know, just a document, later abandoned it. I'm probably going to revive it and, and try and resume the discussion again, and, and hopefully we can come to some thoughts on that. Uh, one of the things that tends to come up a lot is S3 support, critical for mobile, except Surface doesn't use S3 at all. So uh, S3 isn't really an issue for Surface at all. 
They use something called modern standby. They've modified all the drivers so that they do the right things for power. Uh, maybe we should be looking at things like that instead of sort of clinging to S3 and other things like SMM. Servers don't care about this stuff, right? So, I mean, I've never talked to anyone who said, I really care about this in my server. So uh, I can, I'm happy to shed some of the things the Ramstage does today on a server. And then Shane reminded me that IoT doesn't need any of this either. You turn on the IoT, it runs hot the whole time because it's doing stuff like the sonar in your nuclear sub, for those of you who have a nuclear sub. So, um, you know, not really an issue. What we've decided to do until we can better refine what we think ought to happen in core boot, we're going to take a little pause on this core boot work that, that I described here. I'm going to try and revive the discussion in a document, and, and, and we're going to see about bringing people into this whole discussion of what do we do with the RAM stage. Uh, finally, I did um, talk to one person about hardware, and I didn't remember the conversation well enough to put it down here, but basically there was a case where the RAM stage configured PCI and it actually caused trouble for the payload and the payload's access to the PCI and configuration of it. So um, there is, it isn't just about time and, and, and space. It can actually be about correctness. So the RAM stage can do things that cause correctness problems for the payload. So I, I think that you know, the, the time is coming when we've really got to think about the configuration and what we, where we go with the RAM stage now that we have more capable payloads than we used to. And we might not only do redundant work and take up space and flash that we don't need to, we might actually conflict in things we do in the RAM stage with things we want to do in the payload. Um, this actually led to one thing in, in Orboot. Um, we had been calling it the RAM payload in Orboot. We decided to change the name to payloader to make it clear that that intermediate function after the RAM is set up and before the payload is just a thing that loads the payloader. And there might be something else that does what the RAM stage does today, or there might not. It might be just a Linux kernel. Certainly under S5, it's just going to be a Linux kernel. Probably on ARM, it'll just be a Linux kernel. Uh, if we ever find an open x86 where we can own it from you know, the ground up the way we used to, probably would just be a Linux kernel. Um, and so that's it for the core boot part of this talk. Um, these are really describing Subrata's work and then discussions we've had in the reviews and, and with Subrata and I. And that's kind of all. And now I'm going to hand off to Shang, who's going to talk about the Slim Bootloader work. Thank you. OK, thanks, Ron. So now I'm going to talk about the Linux boot POC on Slim Bootloader, which we have done so far. So as mentioned by Ron yesterday, so the key essence here you can see is let Linux do it. I think we are on the same page where that the firmware has to done very minimal work and then hand off the works, the majority work to the kernel itself. So that's why you can see on the, the photo on the right hand side, that's all similar to UFI, core boot RAM stage, U-boot SPL, or the reduced stage two or stage one B, which is a slim boot loader, which is what we're gonna do. So all these three will boot directly to Linux kernel. So these are the concepts that we're gonna to bring today. And Linux boot is going to, it has been deployed today and is uh, uh, going to be uh, in a lot of uh, servers. So that's why it's getting, it's gaining momentum now. So, okay, let me go through the architecture design. So you can see the first one is with the, is the boot stage to Linux OS is the original design without the Linux, Linux boot. So uh, I'm sure those who are from core boot, you can familiar with this. These are a streamlined process. Stage one A, one B, stage two, and then the OS or the EFI payload, and then boot to the Linux OS. But you can see when you go to the if you combine with the Linux boot itself, so you can directly from the stage two jump to the Linux boot and to the Linux OS. And so what is new over here? The uh, things that we can see that uh, we have removed the need of payload to load the OS. Where we can use a Linux boot to done to do all the in kernel initialization, and also the stage two is simplified as a Linux boot kernel takes change. So let me go to the next slide. See how it's simplified. Okay, so you can see over here. These are all the these are the normal boot flow that we have today. I'm not going to go through what everything uh, now. So um, these are standard, right? So let's remove this. So with Linux boot. We are able to remove um, a few things prior to this. 
uh, there's no more, you can see no more uh, payload. You can jump directly to the kernel entry point from the last one. Okay, so that's all right. So that, that's not nothing much to see over here. But wait a second. How about we take out more, even more stuff from here? Well, we can also take out certain part of ACPI tables and then move it uh, to kernel itself. Ah, MP init. We can also even uh, make, take out MP init and let the kernel do the MP init itself. This will even save much more time. So the two key components here, as we can see, is that with all this thing has been removed, we can obviously, we can see faster boot time observed. Um, for the QMU, I think we look around 300 milliseconds, uh, the boot time safe from the stage two itself. And then no more redundancy. When the, what's the point of doing redundancy? To do PCI enumeration in the stage two and then you do it again in the kernel, that doesn't make sense at all. So that's why the, the goal of here is to remove the redundancy and the boot time. So these are two key points that we achieved so far. So, okay, um, let's go to the next one. The actual, so the build data loop payload is quite straightforward. Thanks for Ron. Uh, you just get clone, uh, go to the folder and uh, make stuff, get stuff, and then that's all. You can do it yourself or you can get the kernel directly from me. <laughs> okay, so how to build it, uh, for the, how to build the uh, slim bootloader. Uh, my colleague later will tell you how to do exact reporting, but this is a more simplified version. How to do it? So you just git clone from the same bootloader GitHub, and you just need to how you build it is you just need to fill in these parameters. The first one, the CMD line, there's a dummy file. You don't don't care about it, but the one highlighted in red color, these two are the one you need to change. The first one is the Linux boot image uh, file file name. You have to put it, and then the second one is the command line TXE where the command you need to pass to the when you're loading the kernel. Okay, so these two you have to store inside the payload package slash payload bins. All right. Okay, so these are few parameters where you can change Pyro to uh, using Linux boot. Is, uh, this, if you are from Corboot, you, you know Corboot, you can change the kconfig, right? So these are kind of similar. So inside the build uh, loader Python file, there's a few parameters you need to change. You need to uh, set enable the export. It goes to one, which enable the export support. And the second one, yeah, the uh, reserve memory size is a reserve. You need to increase a reserve memory for Linux kernel lo loading in case that your Linux kernel is in is bigger size. And then, as I mentioned just now, you can disable the PCI enumeration and also disable the MP in it but just already said it equals to zero. You can try it yourself, it's pretty straightforward. It's already there. And also from that side, I hide it in red because if a QEMU, you have to go to QEMU uh, package folder. So there's a two, one, the first one is a payload size itself. It's, you change it according to your kernel size. And the second one is um, uh, you have to add the payload ID to support Linux boot. So that's all. Quite straightforward, right? So let's go to the demo. Okay, let's hope it works. Yeah. Okay, that's it. So this are demo I'm gonna show you. It's pretty fast, but it's not fully optimized yet. Uh, I haven't optimized further because I've done it. Okay. Sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, currently I'm, I'm actually using the up square board as shown by my colleague just now. This is an up square board, which is a community uh, maker's board. We are using Intel Apolic uh, silicon itself and you yeah you can just use it and then hack it the way any way you want so this is how how we try it from there you can see it's pretty fast but it's not yet optimized it can further 
optimize further to make it boot even more faster. All right. So that's it. So here is a summary. So as we had showcased, the slim bootloader has finally uh, officially support Linux boot itself. And it's a because so it actually um, showed that Simboot is a flexible boot solution where you can uh, change it quite easy to optimize it accordingly. So the second thing, as Ron mentioned, it Linux is the mainstream. Uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be deployed in more and more servers itself, especially. So that's why we are making this effort uh, to embrace open source or industry requirements. And the last. We are trying out on a simple loader configure stage two, where you can also try out yourself. So yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Let's have a round of applause. Hello. Your name? Yeah. Sorry? We have a lot of time for questions. Okay. A lot, like. Yeah, we. I won't do. Or like, you can all go out and get some more food. <laughs> I wanted to do an equation that you solve for x, but no. Nah. I yeah. I I did want to mention the 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 shell prompt there that came up was from a shell written in Go because that was the U root um, user land in Linux. So all the all the code there is uh, code written in Go. Uh, yeah. Yesterday there was a mention about uh, Linux drivers not happy if the PCI animation uh, was not done by the BIOS. That was, yeah, 1999. That was true. So, it has so that was kernel, believe it or not, I believe that kernel was 2.0.36. So, so there is no such restriction these days? Uh, there actually is. So the restriction is um, people are always happy to produce code that depends on the BIOS having been run. And on the Winterfell nodes from Facebook, uh, we did about two years ago find an AHCI bug because we you know, we weren't doing a thing. And Jean-Marie uh, Verdun pushed the patch upstream to fix that. So th this is why, um, and I don't think I brought this out as well as I should have yesterday. Um, I was saying it'd be nice if, if we could find a way to make it a policy for Linux to, to be booted on these machines without a, all these Dixies having been run, because you, you do, it's the only real way to find a buggy driver. But it, but it, we, that was in two and a half years. That's actually the only bug I can remember hitting with with that kind of problem. So do I understand right? If the Linux payload will be able to handle the PCI enumeration before transferring to the actual Linux kernel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've been doing that for a couple of years now. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't a little more clear. Hi, Ron. I think uh, Linux boot is really a great idea. So here. Since we are trying to do more things in kernel, right? So mm -hmm. basically, we have to draw a line between the firmware and the kernel. They should have a boundary. Right now, since uh, we are moving more things from uh, firmware traditional BIOS side to the kernel, and uh, it might make kernel a little bit more specific if we do more things. So how do you see what? How do we keep the balance between these two? What basically saying? If board specific, we leave it out and then do not necessarily do it in kernel. So basically, they have some yeah. balance you have to consider, right? So what yeah, we we've now? been doing that a lot, and 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 actually, one of the nastier board specific things has been GPIOs. How do you how do you get that stuff to communicate to the kernel about things like GPIOs and or boot? We're using the flatten device tree. Okay. Um, I actually was watching a slim boot talk and I was screaming inside my head, flatten device tree, flatten device tree. Uh, <laughs> and I kind of wish that, 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 you know, you all would be looking at that because it solved the problem now for a long time and why not just use it? Um, and uh, other than that, I have no idea. I don't have a general answer to your question. It's a really hard problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great to know uh, that trend, I think. Uh, yeah. It's really. Yeah, it's 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 actually the funny thing is it's 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 a it's an area we went over in a lot of depth twenty years ago, and that's the origin of the core boot tables. Actually, right, we were communicating information from core boot to the kernel, and in a lot of ways, we we lost twenty years while you know we went into this proprietary uh, 
uh, jog we've been on, and now we're back trying to solve the problem again. And I'm hoping this time around uh, we we uh, stay on the open path and get this thing solved right. So okay. that's okay. my Thanks hope. Thanks, you're wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I noticed in the um, Obu talk yesterday, it looks like you have the separate stage to load the payload after the Raminit stage. Right? Yeah. The payloader. Yeah. But in your core boot work, I think you're trying to load the payload directly from the ROM stage. So yeah. which of the two approaches is the right one? I don't know. It, this is still all up in the air. And um, I think the main reason we named it payloader was to avoid any implication that we were going to recreate the RAM stage. Um, I, I think that the right mode is if, if you can get by without the RAM stage, do so because you save time and space. But at the same time, that was a conjecture from last fall. And I, I think that if you look at the work with depth charge, there's a clear need for a RAM stage there. And so, or there's a clear need for a something, right? Now, um, thing that we didn't mention yesterday about Orboot is the the format for all the things is going to be self. We're not, we're, you know, we were essentially dropping the stage format entirely because it, one way to look at a, a payload as a stage, if a payload has one, if a self thing has one segment and it's already at the location that it's at, it's kind of implicitly a stage, right? So in some sense, we never needed that, that distinction of stage and payload. Um, so from my point of view, there's there's actually a lot of unknowns at the moment. We're, we're just trying to rethink a little what we've done because um, Linux is just so much more capable than it was, and the original motivations have changed. So we need. I just wanted to try and think about, you know, what should we be doing here? And um, learning about Surface just this morning was a surprise, learning that they haven't used S3 for three or four years. Um, so it, this, is, this is really a lot of open questions. That's a really good question. I don't know the answer. But yeah. they're running Windows, right? So I assume the kernel side looks a lot different than ours. I don't see a reason Linux couldn't be fixed. But I don't think it will be for another 20 years. But I don't see a reason it couldn't be. So yeah. No, it's a good point. They get, they get, they get to fix all their drivers. And they've done a lot of really neat work fixing their drivers. And they're using the instruction for you know whatever it's called, something modern standby. Love the word modern. So modern standby it comes with all this great stuff. But you got to rewrite all your, well, not you got to fix all your drivers. That's a big deal, but they were able to do it. And will Linux catch up? Don't know. So interesting uh, question. But so for the Corbett stuff, would it maybe be easier to just configure the ACPI part or the PCI init part out of the RAM stage rather than dropping it completely? Because yeah, we that might... there were a lot of issues with just pulling the payload loading into the RAM stage. You're right, and and yeah, that might be the right way to go. But I think this is I think. I think this is more about having a discussion and trying things out. So I think the the RAM payload here work that Subrata did, we learned a lot. Um, I think Patrick Georgie's, so I want to revive his CL because I kind of want to revive the discussion. I learned something yesterday from the 3M dev guys about you know their problems. Um, so I think it's a good time just to reopen the discussion a little and see what the right path forward is. And clearly, in some situations, removing the RAM stage is just simply not an option. So we just need to maybe even in sort of lay out the space in which it is an option, in which it isn't an option. But you know, I I think that I didn't I wasn't careful about it, you know, explaining that idea last fall. And I think it's led to a lot of, you know, misunderstandings. Okay, so thanks. yeah. Yeah, I I have a little bit different uh, view. Mm -hmm. uh, do you customize the Linux kernel in the firmware? No. You don't. No. Okay. How you support I, uh, a new bus? I'm sorry. New new type of bus like uh, CXL or CC, CCIX. I would hope. I mean, the whole reason that that Linux bus became practical in 1999 is we had self-describing buses. You know, PCI was a big deal, right? No more dip switches, right? No more of this weird stuff. If you look. In the SOCs in the last couple of years, we've sort of diverged away from self-describing buses. And in some places, we're kind of going back to magic numbers, which is, I think, not a good development. So I would hope that any new thing like CXL, we would continue the goodness of PCI with the self-describing devices. If we fail to do that, we're, we're creating a lot of problems. Um, and then ACPI table, I don't see how can you remove the ACPI table. 
you put it in the init ramifest. We 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 did Trammel did do that experiment, and it he, when he, he told me what he was doing, will, I thought you're nuts. All the features, huh? Our management for Rust. Yeah, I mean you sure and but if you generate with IASL and then as part of your generation in init ramifest, you drop it in a, a certain place. It gets loaded earlier. I've done this actually, so it gets loaded in the early going, and the kernel can't tell that it didn't come from the the and, BIOS. And then the, the last point is why you care about a server boot fast a few seconds. Oh, a uh, server boot once or twice in a lifetime. Why not true. Worry about? Not true at all. Um, and um, in fact, we have cases uh, which I can't talk too much about, but. Well, I, I know I can tell you the one story. You're AT and T. You have a server reboot. It takes too long to reboot. Just pick a server. It takes too long to reboot. Guess what you do next? You file paperwork with the FCC explaining why that took too long to reboot. Yeah, yeah. That is a pain you do not want. So, yeah. so to my surprise, uh, Tom Anschutz said, "Oh my God, if you can fix my boot time problem, you'll make me a very happy person." The next thing he said is, and by the way, I want everything running Linux boot because I'm sick of waiting for all my routers and other things to boot. So yeah, no, 20 but seconds see, or less is the great. The boot time is, if it's two lines, usually you do the uh, RAM testing, right? If you don't test Not on the systems I've seen. Yeah, but I mean, it's actually, it's actually, from what we've seen, it's almost uh, order n squared in the number of Dixies. It's horrible. So if you can take, for example, on this tie-in board, uh, I, we were able to filter out of the 424 Dixies, all of which run, by the way, all of which seem to depend on each other, which means they all run at least twice. Um, we filtered out 214 of those Dixies, and I didn't expect to notice the difference, and it was noticeably faster just to remove Dixies that you didn't even need. So, no, it, it, it's not just RAM test. It's, it's not by any uh, means. Customize, if I customize a regular UEFI BIOS, I can boot to window in two seconds. Oh, great. Right. So... It's, why? It's so tell a, me, tell me why all my server nodes take ten minutes? It's it's a customization issue. It's not the boot boot process issue. That's what I think. And it's not our. It's not. It's can, not you our. Can, it's not our experience. But I can't argue if that's your experience. Then my last so. point is, if uh, manufacturer they already test the UEFI boot to everything thoroughly, and then you throw in uh, something that is never tested by the the silicon vendor. It's, I don't see what is the advantage. I guess based on my experience with servers, I wouldn't want to say that things are tested. Yeah, you need a test anyway. So well, let's just say I would say that they're tested as thoroughly as we're testing them now with Linux boot because we can boot so quickly. I mean, if I, if I boot in twenty seconds, I can do roughly sixteen times as many tests a day as when you boot in ten minutes. It becomes practical to do a thousand test cycles. Not practical with UEFI off the shelf that I get from vendors, right? I mean, I've got a machine right now from a very credible company. God, it takes like five minutes before I can press the power button. Wow, okay. it's horrendous. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And then it's another five to ten minutes before I gotta I have any kind of ability to interact with the machine. So you know, twenty seconds versus many minutes is a really big deal for testing. You cannot do a lot of testing if a machine takes eight to ten minutes to boot. You just can't. So okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, Ron, how are you? Hi. Hey. Uh, so just to uh, follow up with uh, what uh, Maurice was saying earlier, yeah, about um, some of the things that are platform dependent. Yeah. Like for example, if you take servers, yeah, we have PCI slots you have to bifurcate. Yeah. Based on how the number of slots yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number of width of the slots are right. Yeah, and then you also have things like if you have PCI SSDs and hot plug. Yeah, you don't know which slots are hot pluggable slots, what the uh, addresses of those VPP ports. So a lot of things that are platform knowledge that comes along with it. Yeah, not just you cannot you can ignore the platform and move everything to the to a, you know Linux uh, kernel. Right? Yeah, so that's I mean just I'm trying to understand how you're trying to solve that problem. So there there are so the hot plug thing, I totally. I, I pretty much don't buy because there's like X million machines and data centers out there that nobody's ever going to hot plug anything, right? They roll well, them out and they uh, run them. I'm sorry, and, but, but PC SSDs these days, you are right, never happened yeah. before. But with front panel PC SSDs, there are, if you have there, RAID configuration, and there, you can remove one and then you can replace it if it's a failing SSD. 
just just happening now. It, yeah. So it depends on your uh, on how you go about doing those things. Right. Um, but um, but I give yeah. We should probably have a discussion offline because I don't know. I'm, okay, okay. This is being so, recorded. Right. So <laughs> so uh, again, but what I'm saying is a lot. Of, just give an example, right? Yeah. But a lot of platform specific things. Yeah. That, that is today. Um, it, if you want to make the case that this idea of putting the ACP tables in the initRAMFS is complete bunk, I'm not going to make. I'm not going to try and argue you out of it. Because <laughs> you're probably right. It's just it's just something that we did experiment with and found in some cases would actually work. Okay. Uh, is it is it is it entirely practical? Not really sure. Uh, I note that on the RISC five, one of the things on the high five uh, or the FU five forty chip is. Uh, the uh, Mascrom hands you an FDT, right? You get it right out of the Mascrom, you get an FDT, and you're supposed to build the rest. Funny story, the FDT we're getting seems to be complete garbage, so we're having to build it anyway in Linux. So, you know, um, this this argument can go either way, is okay. what we're learning. And, and there is, I don't think there's any certainty as to the right way to do it. And uh, the second thing is just to add to this point on boot time. Right? Mm -hmm. So the majority of the boot time is taken by ECC init. So when you come up at a cold boot, memory is not initialized with zeros, which means the ECC doesn't match. Yeah, oh, I know. Right. So I know that one very well. Yes. So that's the major <laughs> uh, task that major time-consuming task mm -hmm. to go and write all zeros so that ECC word matches with the data. Hey, Ryan. Is most of our memory uh, gone? And Ryan, is most of our boot time taken up with ECC init? No. How how, how big it's is just not? I, I mean, I give you an example. Uh, a lot of these things are some damn Pixie thing in there, which you got to turn off. And when Pixie goes to enumerate Ethernet, it'll wait 30 seconds on every Ethernet port to figure oh, yeah. out that so, it doesn't have carrier. Sure. And Linux will do that step in seconds because no. it can turn them on all for, at once. Yeah, right? for, for the boot, so, boot selection, I agree with that, right? Yeah, So there, but, but again, there are 424 Dixies in this one small server board, and they all time out on something, Sure. okay? And I don't want them, and I don't need them, and I want to get rid of them. Sure. And when we do that, Okay. Typically, we we our time goes from minutes to seconds. It yeah. just does. So, okay, maybe ECC net is important. I actually think there's better ways to do it than we're doing it today. Um, but all that said, um, not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is a lot of badly written Dixies. We we actually have one board. I won't name the vendor, uh, but we found uh, you know it was an AMD board, and we found a bunch of Intel Dixies in there. Sure. So there's incredible sloppiness on the part of the companies shipping UEFI, our proposal to solve the problem is to get rid of all that stuff, right? Sure. And, and when we do that, all of a sudden, gosh, our boot time is great. Yeah, so. And, uh, you know, so, and, and further on a tie-in board where we hit, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the Winterfell board where we hit 20 seconds, the first thing we did actually was just replace the, the UEFI shell with, with the Linux kernel, right. you know? So that was an ECC init, right? Because that was a constant in each case. Right. So basically, if you remember last OCP summit in Amsterdam, yeah, we demoed a five-second warm reset and a ten-second cold reset on a OCP platform, server platform. Yeah, it's great. Um, and again, we took a lot of things out of the Dixie phase. Sure. Things that you have platform dependency on, for example, BMC. We wait for the BMC to come up. Test twenty seconds, right? And mm -hmm. then you uh, on a cold boot, so you have to wait for that. IPMI commands take a lot longer. So if you strip everything down to a bare yeah. minimum required, I can bring it down to five seconds and we demo it. But I it, think right? you're supporting my argument. So, but how do you? We strip all that stuff out and it gets better. Don't right? you need those stuff? So ECC and it is still occurring, but we strip all that stuff out and it got better. Right, but then that's, if you, I mean, that's supporting. Isn't that no, supporting my argument? Or well, not? if you may take ECC and it out. Yeah. Then you crash no, 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 no. I'm not saying take ECC in and out. Okay. I'm saying you sh you demonstrated this really neat thing, 10 second boot, by stripping a lot of stuff out that you don't sure. need. That's no, our that's our whole argument. A lot of I can demonstrate something that I can by taking away things I don't need for boot. Yeah. But I need for functionality. So if I need to have BMC logging all the errors that are coming up, I need the functionality. So if you start adding platform functionalities on top of your basic baseline, then you but start adding boot time. I don't need HTTPS. Dixie. I don't need TCP IAP6 ping yeah, Dixie. I don't need um, SendMail Dixie, which we, we are finding. I don't need the yeah, SendMail Dixie agree. password. Right. I don't need AHCI Dixie. I don't need ISA Dixie. 
I don't need VFAT Dixie. It's a long list, right? I could, it's 214 things. I'm not going to do them all, right? And when I remove those things, it gets a lot faster. Yeah. ECC and it is still occurring. So if I remove all these things, I'm down. I've, I've chopped off seven minutes and 40 seconds. It's not the ECC and it. It's just not. Sure. So those things that, uh, like the HTTPS, those things, yeah, you were right. Uh, those things. And they always, by the way, those things not everybody good. knows this. Every single Dixie, at least it runs the init function. Because there's the protocol GUID in the Dixie, you cannot discover without running the init function. Okay. So all those Dixies run, whether you think they run or not. They all run even if you think they're not configured. That's what we, that was the shock for us, right? There's the file GUID and the protocol GUID, and you can't know the protocol GUID because it's not at a fixed place in the object. The only way you can learn a protocol GUID is run the init function in a Dixie. Every Dixie will run at least once. If any Dixie has dependencies on other Dixies, they'll run at least twice. And that's the problem. If you've got code from AMI that has a hidden dependency on a Dixie because the code's not written correctly, um, it'll run more than that. If you remove English.dxe because you don't know what English.dxe is, then the AMI firmware will crash. Sure. So, you know, because yeah, it's not properly listed as a dependency in the AMI TSC. Yeah. So, nope, it's got to go. We want it all gone. All right. Thanks. Yeah. But thank you. And you. Those are good points. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. That is for that's it for questions, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, let's have another round of applause. And.